Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar in collaboration with the Revenue on the Temporary Wage Subsidy Scheme, the Employment Wage Subsidy Scheme and other employment tax updates. My name is Colin Forbes and I'm a tax and legal partner here at Deloitte and I'll be hosting the webinar today. The measures announced in the July stimulus package, which includes the Employment Wage Subsidy Scheme or EWSS for short, if you took them as a mini budget would represent the largest budgetary expansion in recent history. The EWSS is the pivotal part of that stimulus package and will cost the state 2.3 billion euros over the period to the 31st of March, 2021. The longer time period of this new scheme is very welcome and it will play a pivotal role in enabling the Irish economy to bounce back, helping struggling businesses to stay afloat and keep their employees engaged by protecting the incomes of individuals. The EWSS replaces the Temporary Wage Subsidy Scheme or TWSS and according to Revenue's latest statistics, the cumulative value of payments made under the TWSS is now 2.6 billion. Over 66,000 employers have received TWSS subsidy payments and an estimated 655,000 employees have received a subsidy since the start of that scheme. Given the importance of these schemes, we're delighted to partner again today with the Revenue Commissioners to discuss the finer details of the two schemes. Siobhan Gilburn from the Revenue Commissioners will provide an overview of both schemes as well as our colleagues, Garoud Murphy, Anne Lee, and Laura Glancy, who will join us for a Q&A session after the presentations. Our own Jackie Collin, Director in our Global Employer Services team, will also be speaking in some more detail on the Employment Wage Subsidy Scheme. And Ian Prenti, also Director in our Global Employer Services team, will be discussing other employment tax and mobility updates. Before we start, just a couple of housekeeping points. The speaker presentations will last about 45 minutes in total, with a Q&A session for 15 minutes afterwards. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please submit them through the Q&A box in the panel at the bottom of your screen. And please note this session is being recorded and we will be issuing a recording to you all after the webinar with a copy of the slide deck. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Siobhan Gilburn, who's going to take us through the TWSS and EWSS. Um, thank you, Colin. And I just, I just want to say thank you to Deloitte for having us and allowing us to use this platform to get TWSS and EWSS information out there to your members. So I'm going to go through, um, I'm going to give you a brief reminder of some of the operational aspects of the TWSS that will continue after the 31st of August, as employers will still be availing of the scheme until, until then. And I'll also talk you through some of the EWSS aspects. So just on the next slide, um, just an overview of the temporary wage subsidy scheme. So the TWSS aimed to maximise staff retention and the viability of the employer's business through this crisis by maintaining that employer-employee link and offered financial supports to employees of employers negatively affected by the pandemic. The subsidy was calculated using the ARNWP, so the average revenue net weekly pay from the January and February payroll, and then based on rates as determined by the Minister for Finance subject to tiering or tapering arrangements. The subsidy amounts were then paid to the employee by the employer and the employer then received a refund of those amounts from revenue. So the key benchmark for eligibility of TWSS was a minimum of a 25% reduction in turnover or customer orders with employees being eligible if they were on the employer's payroll at the 29th of February and were included in qualifying payroll submissions. Registration for TWSS was through that self-declaration on Ross. However, this is closed from the 31st of July, so no new employers have been able to avail of TWSS since then. Current employers on TWSS can continue to avail of this until the 31st of August 2020 when the scheme closes. So just some stats on the TWSS. As of the 20th of August, statistics published on Revenue website, there were 69,500 employers registered for TWSS with 66,000 receiving payments um, for 655,700 employees availing of the support under TWSS and we paid out 2.6 billion. 
including tax refunds of around 151 million. <clears throat> So just uh, moving forward from TWSS, I'll talk to you about compliance, the compliance check program, the interview review, how employers stop operating the scheme and reconciliation. It's so just on the next slide. Um, so to ensure the TWSS is operated correctly, revenue is conducting a program of compliance checks on all employers who availed of the scheme at any stage, not just those currently availing of it. Letters are issuing to employers and their agents where relevant, <clears throat> mainly through the My Inquiries inbox. Revenue teams are working these cases in batches, so if employers have not received anything yet, keep an eye on that inbox for correspondence, as there is a term turnaround time on these letters. It is essential that employers respond promptly, as failure to do so may lead to sus suspension of future payments. Um, just contact the caseworker and inform them that you're working to get the relevant, relevant information to them and keep the lines of communication open with revenue. So these are criteria, so they will be asked for details of business activities, the negative impact suffered. If the business was closed, they will be asked to provide the date of closure or date of disruption. If they were excuse me, if they were unable to pay normal wages or outgoings, they may be asked to provide financial details to support this and also details and evidence of the basis for meeting the reduction in, in the 25% turnover test. The check also ensures that employees have received the correct amount of subsidy and that it, it is being recorded on the employee pay slips. So they may be asked for evidence to support this, which will include a sample of copies of pay slips. So the compliance check is not part of an audit or an intervention. The contact, it, <clears throat> the contact is a request for information to provide assurance that the scheme has been operated as intended by the employers. In addition, the compliance check program will address any issues identified in respect of the operation of real-time PAYE or PMAS by employers over 2019 and 2020 and will provide an opportunity for employers to address any other outstanding tax issues they may have. This will be of importance to employers who may intend to avail of the debt warehousing scheme for employer PAYE and VAT liabilities that were encouraged during the pandemic period, as up-to-date compliance will be a prerequisite in order to avail of that scheme. So to date, we've had a positive response to this programme, with most employers responding within the required time and providing the requested documentation. Again, it's just important to keep watching the My Inquiries inbox for that correspondence if you have not received the letter yet and to make contact with the caseworker when you receive the letter and you should get a notification in the inbox stating that the check has been completed when it's done. So moving on to the next slide, the end of your review. Um, the TWSS payments are liable to income tax and universal social charge, the USC, and the pandemic unemployment payment is liable to income tax. These are not or have not been taxed in real time through the normal PAYE system, but they will be liable for tax in USC by way of an end of year review for the employee. When this end of year review is carried out, should an income tax liability arise, it is normal revenue practice to collect any tax owing in manageable amounts for the employee. This is done by reducing an individual's tax credits for a future year or years in order to minimise any hardship. In this instance, reduction of credits will be from 2022 and may continue to 2026, depending on the circumstances of the employee. <clears throat> so if an employee wants to make a payment to revenue, they can also do that. And additionally, any individual may have tax credits to claim in respect of the 2020 tax year. So for example, health expenses, which can be used to offset any possible liability. When the continuation of the TWSS was announced at the end of August 2020, in order to further minimise that liability at the end of year, revenue placed all employees that received payments on e under either TWSS or PUP on a non-cumulative week one basis. This was a further attempt to minimise the liability or hardship for employees. And employees on TWSS placed on a week one will continue on a week one basis until the end of the year Employees not previously on TWSS where their employer is joining EWSS will be taxed as normal in real time. And I'll talk to you a bit more about that on the EWSS slides. 
So on to the next slide, how to stop operating, operating the scheme. So employers have had the option at any point of, the, of TWSS to stop operating the scheme. And this was done by them simply stop making J9 submissions and returning all employees to the normal PRSI class. Payments under TWSS are paid to employers on a pay date basis, not an earned basis. So on the closing of the TWSS on the 31st of August, revenue will no longer accept J9 PRSI class payroll submission unless this is the normal and correct PRSI class for employees. Payroll submissions received with pay dates up to and including the 31st of August will be processed for subsidy under TWSS for eligible employers in relation to eligible employees. And payroll submissions received with pay dates on and from the 1st of September 2020 will be processed for subsidy under EWSS for eligible employers in relation to eligible employees for, who, for whom the subsidy is payable. So effectively, that just means the pay dates will determine the eligibility for either TWSS or EWSS. And the employer must retain all records for the operation of the TWSS, including subsidy payments to employees. This will be very important as we move into the reconciliation phase and employers operating TWSS will be included in the reconciliation phase and a list of employers will be published on revenue.ie at the end of the scheme. Just moving on to the reconciliation. Um, it, this is currently in development and testing phase and further guidance will issue when available. Essentially, revenue will reconcile each employer who operated the TWSS on each active payslip. So as you might, might remember, back in March, the employer refund scheme was launched and then the TWSS was launched. Revenue refunded the maximum amount of subsidy of €410 Euro per employee to employers, regardless of the subsidy that was paid. As we moved into the operational phase on the 4th of May, revenue provided all the necessary details regarding employee subsidy amounts to employers on a CSV file to ensure the correct amount of subsidy was paid to the employee and refunded to the employer. So this gives rise to the requirement for a reconciliation of those balances from the transitional to the operational phase of TWSS. As part of the reconciliation process, the employer will report the subsidy paid amount to revenue this is the amount actually paid by the employer to the employee in terms of subsidy. <clears throat> the reconciliation will calculate the subsidy payable, and this is the subsidy the employee is due based on the rules of the scheme as set out in Section 28 of the Emergency Measures in the Public Interest, the COVID-19 Act 2020, and the subsequent determination by the Minister of Finance on the 16th of April when the scope of the scheme was expanded. So the calculation will then look at the subsidy paid, <clears throat> which is reported by the employer, the subsidy payable as calculated by revenue, and a third category caseworker resolved. So this is where a caseworker manually resolves the case. There are options for employers to report subsidy paid under both the TWSS and employer refund scheme. And they can be sorry, and they can be reported through either a CSV upload available in Ross or revenue payroll reporting in Ross. So for employers who have a large number of employees, the CSV upload option to report subsidy paid is the most convenient. Most payroll software providers will support this option and employers should check with their payroll operators to confirm if the CSV option to report subsidy is available. This is expected to be available from mid-September 2020 and an instruction manual for employers wishing to use this option is being prepared. Um, <clears throat> Employers can also report the subsidy paid by manually amending the payroll notification in Ross. This is currently available. So if you have a small number of employees, you can do that now. And once the employer has provided the subsidy paid amounts for all active pay slips, this will trigger the reconciliation process. <clears throat> it is envisaged that the reconciliation calculation will be available in October. The amounts, <coughs> excuse me, the amounts will be included on a reconciliation CSV file, which will be available to download. A message will be sent to the Ross inbox advising the employer or agent that the CSV is available for download. And also a statement of account will also be sent to the Ross inbox with the reconciliation totals. And just a final point to note there. Um, so for employers making refunds of TWSS back to revenue, there is a new RevPay facility 
available. Employers are requested to no longer use the bank details or the EFT method as previously advised but ensure, and ensure that only amounts of temporary wage subsidy scheme payments are repaid to revenue and do not include any payments in respect of income tax and USC refunded. So any repayment of income tax or USC should be separately paid under the PAYE EMP to ensure the payment is correctly reflected in the employer's PAYE EMP balance. And there are instructions in the FAQ document on the revenue website, and there's a dedicated link as well in the COVID info hub on the revenue website. So now I'm gonna <clears throat> move into the EWSS, so the, um, and just on the next slide, sorry. Um, the transitioning from TWSS to EWSS. So as I mentioned, the TWSS will expire on 31st of August and no new employers have been able to join the scheme since 31st of July. But current employers availing of it will be able to continue with TWSS until this time. The Employment Wage Subsidy Scheme, as announced by government on 23rd of July, and will, effect, will effectively replace the temporary wage subsidy scheme from the 1st of September 2020 and will continue until the 31st of March 2021. However, both schemes will run in parallel from the 1st of July 2020 until the TWSS ceases at the end of August 2020. As employers who were not eligible for TWSS or who had employees not eligible for TWSS can claim EWSS in respect of these employees from the 1st of July, these will be dealt with as part of a sweep back mechanism, which is currently under development with proposal for payment of those cases being made in mid-September. Employers must register for the EWSS as well. And under EWSS, the employer will pay the employee their normal gross weekly wages. Revenue will pay the subsidy via EFT directly to the employer in respect of each eligible employee following submission of the normal payroll return. So legislation itself for the EWSS was signed into law on the 1st of August and guidance material has been published on our website since the 14th of August. Um, just to note, you should refer to this in the first instance, instance to have any, or to answer any queries you may have and it will be updated regularly with any changes. So it's just worth keeping an eye on the guidance document. And as mentioned in Q4 2020, um, the reconciliation phase will happen and the EWSS will cease at the end of March 2021. So just on to the next slide, the key features of EWSS. <clears throat> so seasonal and new hires are included and backdated to the 1st of July, as mentioned, subject to limited exceptions, with payments expected to be made by revenue in mid-September and then payments for subsequent periods, periods being made monthly in arrears thereafter. Employer and employee eligibility and tax clearance. So I'll talk to you a bit more about this on the next few slides. Um, one key point would be that employers must have tax clearance to register for EWSS. Publication, so as with the TWSS and in line with international practice, a list of employers availing of EWSS will be published in two tranches. So in January, 2021 and in April, 2021 on the revenue website. Registration went live on the 18th of August. You can register through Ross on the My Services page, click Manage Tax Registrations in the Other Services section, and then just click Register next to the EWSS. And subsidy is a flat rate based on employee gross weekly pay, and I'll talk, talk about the rates in a few moments as well. EWSS will be operated through normal payroll and taxation systems, so employers will be required to operate payroll taxes in real time on all gross payments to be made to their employees. And in relation to the PRSI rate, while employers are required to report and pay the full rate of employer and employee PRSI on receipt of payroll submissions, revenue will apply a reduced rate of 0.5% in respect of employees for whom a subsidy is payable. Employer monthly liabilities will be revised accordingly and any resulting PRSI credit will be available for offset against future employer liabilities. And there are safeguards to minimise abuse of the system and I'll talk to you in a bit more detail in later slides about that as well. So moving on to employer eligibility. So to qualify, employers must be able to demonstrate to the satisfaction of revenue that their business has been significantly disrupted by reason of COVID-19 um, 
and they must demonstrate at least a 30% decline in either the turnover of the employer's business or in orders received during the period of the 1st of July 2020 to the 31st of December 2020, as compared to the same period in 2019. So just on the next slide, so in cases where the business of the employer has not operated for the whole of the corresponding period in 2019, the following will apply. So where the business operations have commenced on or before the 1st of November 2019, the 30% decline test must be determined in 2020 by reference to the same reference period in 2019 in which the business was in operation. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Where the business has commenced after the 1st of November 2019, the employer must be able to show that the turnover or orders during the period of the 1st of July to the 31st of December 2020 will be at least 30% less than what the turnover or orders should have been had there been no disruption caused by COVID-19. On to the next slide, employers must have tax clearance to be eligible to join the EWSS and must remain tax clear to continue receiving EWSS benefits. <clears throat> so in order to qualify for tax clearance, employers must be compliant with all tax obligations under tax legislation in relation to the filing of tax returns and payment of taxes. However, if you have if you have filed all your tax returns but are not in a position to pay all your tax liabilities and have tax debts that cannot be warehoused under the COVID-19 debt warehousing scheme, you can still obtain tax clearance if you entered a phase payment arrangement and this will be done through the Collector General's office. So where an employer files a payroll submission for EWSS but is not in possession of an e-tax clearance, a warning will issue advising that e-tax clearance is not in place. So hopefully this will provide adequate notice to the employer to regularize, regularize the position prior to the return due date, that being the 14th of the following month to ensure the employer gets the payment of the subsidy. And it's very important for employers to check their e-tax clearance and instruct, there are instructions on the website how to apply for tax clearance and you can check your tax clearance on the website as well. So employers are also required to review the eligibility criteria at the end of each month from August 2020 to February 2021. So if as a result of this review at the end of each month it transpires that the employer is no sorry it transpires that the employer is no longer no longer qualifies they should withdraw from the scheme on ROS with effect from the first day of the following month and cease claiming the subsidy. So this review is to ensure that the projected turnover or order reduction of at least 30% for July to December 2020 remains valid and does not require adjustment, be, adjustment based on actual trading results to date, together with other developments in the employer's business or the mar marketplace, which may impact on projected turnover for the six month period. So if you find yourself unregistering, employers can re-register if a review during the following months shows that they once again expect a 30% reduction for July to December 2020. And this registration cannot be backdated to encompass the period where the 30% reduction was not expected. So moving on to employee eligibility. So as mentioned, employee eligibility has been extended to seasonal workers and new hires and they will be included in the sweepback facility to the 31st of July 2020. Childcare businesses registered in accordance with Section 58C of the Child Care Act 1991 are also included in the scheme. So non-TWSS employers or non-eligible TWSS employees are eligible from the 1st of July through a sweepback mechanism. Um, revenue will pay the subsidy in these circumstances no later than the 15th of September. Where an employer registered for EWSS is making a claim for these cases, they will be required to provide information including PPSN, employment ID, payment frequency, commencement date, etc. electronically using a template which will be made available on revenue.ie before the end of August. Once this information is received, revenue will upload this information and calculate the total subsidy due to be paid. The subsidy will be paid into the designated bank account as soon as practical practicable after the 14th of September. There are no restrictions under the transfer of undertakings, protection of employment, so the two arrangements, provided such recruitments or movements are undertaken for bona fide business purposes and not with the intention to maximize the subsidy claims. So there are some restrictions, <clears throat> excuse 
excuse me, certain categories are specifically specifically excluded in the legislation, such as proprietary directors and connected parties. So for proprietary directors, in recognition of the role played by certain proprietary directors in providing employment to others, especially in the SME sector, it has been agreed that EWSS can be claimed in, res in respect of certain proprietary directors and additional guidance will be, will be provided in due course. And connected parties who were not on the payroll at any time between the 1st of July 2019 and June the and sorry, and the 30th of June 2020, so brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, nieces, nephew, etc. And these are also included in this will also be included in the guidance document. So moving on to the registration. Um, registration for EWSS went live on the 18th of August, and the employer, their agent or payroll provider can register for EWSS. So registration for EWSS is through Ross under Manage My Registrations and there is a self-declaration to be made. Registration applications will only be processed if the employer is registered for PAYE PRSI as an employer and has a bank account linked to that registration and has e-tax clearance. So it's important just to look into the tax clearance as soon as possible and if you need to get your tax clearance up to date. Um, moving on now to the subsidy rates. So the EWSS subsidy is a flat rate to the employer and based on the employee's gross weekly wage. Um, so where an employee's weekly gross pay is less than €151.50, no subsidy is payable. Where the employee's weekly gross pay is between €151.50 up to €202.99, a subsidy of €151.50 is payable. And then from 203 euro to up to 1,462 euro, uh, a subsidy of 203 euro is payable. And then anything over an employee's weekly gross pay over 1,462 euro, there is no subsidy payable. <clears throat> so moving on to the operating of EWSS. So as mentioned, the subsidy is based on the employee's gross weekly wage. The gross wage includes notional pay before the deduction of pensions or salary sacrifice, but excludes any DEASP benefits which employees may have mandated to be paid to the employer. So for example, in this maternity or adoptive. So where a pay frequency is other than weekly, the employer will calculate the gross weekly wage and divide by the number of insurable weeks to a maximum. And we will issue an update to the guidance around these limits. Where payroll is monthly, if employers are found to manipulate the system by changing pay frequencies, pay dates or altering amounts to maximise subsidy, they will be liable to recoupment of the subsidy received together with interest penalties and possible prosecution. So the EWSS is returning to the normal payroll process for PRSI, PAYE and deductions with the payroll being taxed in the live environment. So the EWSS indicator will not be the J9 um, as was the case for TWSS, it'll go back to normal class using the other payments field on the payroll submission with a value between zero and one to indicate the subsidy request. So this will not appear on the employee pay slip. Payroll submissions are to be made to revenue by return filing date of the relevant month. So that's the 14th of the following month. And where there are multiple employments, each eligible employer makes a claim for subsidy in their own right for the eligible employee. And now onto the safeguards and compliance. Um, it's my last slide. So the act includes a specific anti-avoidance provision which seeks to counteract contrived situations where the gross pay due to an employee is deferred, suspended, increased or decreased with a view to securing the wage subsidy or in situations where an employee is laid off and removed from the payroll and replaced with two or more employees for whom the subsidy would be pay available. So if revenue identify any such cases, the employer will be treated as having never been eligible for the scheme and any subsidy payments received would need to be refunded together with possible interest and penalties. Employers should retain all evidence and supporting documentation of their operation of EWSS as, a compliance, as compliance checks will be undertaken. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there will be compliance checks on a percentage of employers operating the EWSS on a random or risk rate basis. 
So that brings me to the end of the presentation. Thank you for listening. And as mentioned, there's a guidance document available on our website for EWSS. There is also other information under the July Stimulus Hub that may be useful. Um, thank you. I'm just going to hand you over to Jackie. Thank you, Siobhan, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I suppose before I kick off, just a reminder, if you have any questions that you'd like addressed at the end of the session in the Q&A, please submit them as we're going through the presentation. So we just go on to the first slide. I'm just going to talk a little bit further on, around some of the employer eligibility issues, which Siobhan has already touched on in the course of her presentation. So as already mentioned, there has to have been a 30% reduction in turnover or customer orders for the period 1 July 2020 to 31 December 2020, when compared to the equivalent period in 2019, with certain other um, parameters for businesses which commenced before 1 November 2019, where you're looking at the comparable period, and then for businesses which commenced after 1 November 2019, where you're looking at projected turnover or customer orders for the July 2020 to 31 December 2020 period. Then, as already mentioned, employers must review their eligibility starting from August and I suppose reassess on a month by month basis whether they can continue with participation in the scheme. So if you are no longer meeting the criteria, you will need to deregister from the scheme with effect from the first day of the following month. So if we take for an example a situation where your turnover was exceptionally strong for September, but you hadn't actually foreseen that when you did your initial projections, you will have to reassess your overall position in light of your projections for October, November and December to determine if you're going to meet that 30% reduction for the entire period as a whole. If you consider you won't meet that 30% reduction, you must deregister. However, as Siobhan has mentioned, you can re-register at a later date if your future results, say for October, November, etc., indicate that overall your 30% reduction will be met for that period. Now, the downside of this is that when you do re-register, it cannot be backdated to, the, to include the period of time where you exited the scheme. So then touching again on the tax clearance point, I suppose really can't reiterate strongly enough how important it is for people to address this as, as a matter of priority. The requirement for a valid tax clearance, I suppose, is a new feature of the scheme when compared to the TWSS. And it's vital that the tax clearance must be in place at the time of registration and also throughout the period of the scheme. So it's really important to remember that not only must the tax affairs of the applicant be in order, but also of any connected parties. So where an application for tax clearance is made, revenue will check any director or shareholder who holds more than 50% where the applicant is a company. It would also check the partnerships of which a company or an individual is a member, any previous business entity if there had been a transfer of a liquor license. If a company is a member of a VAC trading group, the VAC compliance of the remitting company where the, the company is a non-remitter and also it will, revenue will also check the, the tax status of any properties of an applicant. So as Siobhan has mentioned, if there's any outstanding returns or liabilities for the applicant or connected parties, tax clearance will be refused, subject to certain mitigating factors, which we'll touch on later on in the slide on the July stimulus package. So if we move on to the next slide. Just in terms of business divisions and eligibility, the 30% reduction in turnover test can be applied at the level of an entity or of individual business divisions if such a decline is capable of being separately identified. So a business division in a company must have a clearly defined and separate management structure which is separate to other business divisions in the company. And importantly, those structures must have been formalised and been well established before the advent of the COVID pandemic. Now, as you can appreciate, every business will have its own unique characteristics. So unfortunately, there isn't really a prescriptive set of guidelines which revenue can set out to say what would constitute a business division for this purpose. But examples of indicators would be that the division would have separate financial statements. It would have its own separate budgets a separate payroll and different management teams. But again, that's not an exhaustive list and each business really will have to make its own reasonable assumptions and it would be important to document those and have the rationale 
documented and ready to, to I suppose, discuss with revenue should further proofs be required uh, in terms of why you took the business division approach rather than the entity approach. So then moving on to the next slide, just in terms of the July stimulus package and some of the measures which have been introduced by government, I suppose really to acknowledge that businesses can't enter into the normal arrangements to settle tax debts in light of the, the current pandemic. So the July job stimulus package announced that revenue would defer or warehouse any unpaid VAT and POE debts arising from the COVID restricted trading period for a period of 12 months after the business reopens and there will be no interest chargeable during this time. In addition, a lower rate of 3% per annum will apply to the repayment of warehouses, warehouse debts after that 12 month period has elapsed. So the warehouse period is the period when the business was unable to trade due to the COVID restrictions and includes two months after the recommencement of the trade, which is the end of the first full by monthly VAT period. So this um, provision will apply automatically to customers in revenues, personal and business division, which is businesses where the annual turnover is less than 3 million euro per annum. Taxpayers in revenues, large corporate and medium enterprises divisions will also be considered for inclusion in the scheme where they apply to revenue for a warehousing arrangement because of a reduction in trade as a result of the COVID pandemic. So it's important to note that taxpayers must continue to file returns for all taxes and maintain their current tax payments in order to avail of these reduced interest rates. In relation to what we'd refer as non-COVID tax debts, the government also announced a reduced rate of 3% per annum interest to apply to these older tax liabilities and debts which are not associated with COVID and which cannot be warehoused. So this represents a significant reduction from the standard interest rates on late payment of tax. And as Siobhan has mentioned, taxpayers must agree a, a phased payment arrangement with revenue before 30th of September 2020. And the reduced rate would then will be applicable from 1 August or from the date of agreement, whichever it is later. So this was really the key um, impact of, of these measures as they relate to EWSS is that where there is warehousing of tax debt, there won't be a denial of tax clearance. And also where somebody has entered into a phased payment arrangement, this must be in place for non-COVID tax debts in order to qualify for tax clearance. So really, I suppose the one key takeaway from all of this is just to, to make sure that you're addressing your, your tax clearance position or your warehouse debt arrangements, just to ensure that you are eligible for registration for the scheme. So that concludes my few slides on the EWSS, and I'm going to hand you over to my colleague, Ian Prempty, who will talk you through some employment and mobility updates. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Um, so we ran a session on the wage subsidy scheme back in May, and those of you who were at that might remember Colin speaking about some of the COVID-19 employment tax issues thrown up by people working from home in Ireland, um, such as the e-worker allowance of 3.20 a day and the concession from Benefit in Kind where employers purchase office equipment for use by employees at home. Um, I'm instead going to highlight very quickly some of the issues thrown up by employees who work from home, where home is in a country other than where they are employed. Um, so it could be an Irish employee who is currently sat in the UK working from home or an employee of a German company, let's say, uh, currently working from home in Ireland. Um, and I suppose this throws up quite a lot of risks. Um, with my employment tax hat on, um, the obvious ones are risks around which country should payroll withholding be operated in, or even should it be operated in both countries. Um, there might even be a different answer again when it comes to the employee filing uh, personal income tax returns. So there will likely be an impact there too. Um, there's a lot of corporate risk that this throws up too. Um, for example, does the employee's presence in their home country create a permanent establishment risk for the employing company in that country? Um, do the transfer pricing arrangements need to be looked at? Um, there can be VAT risks. There can be an impact on the availability of R&D credits where relevant. Um, th there's, there's potentially a lot of issues thrown up just by this simple thing of an employee working from home in another country, um, possibly just to be close to family during the pandemic, so no nefarious intentions either. Um, there can be legal issues too, such as employment law considerations in the other country, um, or issues around immigration permissions. Does the employee have permission to work in that country? 
Uh, I think the bottom line with it is that tracking and monitoring of uh, where employees are is crucial. Um, and companies might need to consider implementing policies in this area, uh, which might even include establishing processes to deal with those issues that are thrown up. Um, but I suppose rather than just talking about problem areas, it is good to highlight some good news that came out during uh, the COVID period too. Um, so if we can flick on to the next slide, please. Um, that good news came in the context of um, business visitors to Ireland. Um, so people employed by a non-Irish company who work in Ireland on a short-term basis. And how does Irish PAYE apply to them? Um, and revenue issued new guidance in this area on the 24th of June. Um, and as a quick summary, as I said, it, it is good news. It, it simplifies things. Um, so without meaning to get into a history lesson in the area, I think the first iteration of these rules came out in 2007 and, and they were clear and they worked quite well. Um, those rules were revised in 2016 to introduce additional tests, um, for example, um, where an employee was in Ireland and working for the benefit of the Irish company. Additional complications arose, which effectively brought in the principles of an economic employer into the equation, and Ireland has, has only ever considered an individual's legal employment up to that point. Um, so th this kind of complicated things. Um, further guidance in 2018 introduced a multi-year test, which meant that companies didn't just have to keep track of employees coming into Ireland in a particular tax year, but extended that to potentially a three-year rolling period. Um, so companies at that stage then were into difficult territory in terms of tracking days over multiple years, as well as noting the purpose of the visit from an economic employer perspective too. So I guess the, the guidance that issued now on the 24th of June, um, if I can go back to the, to the good news, we are pretty much back to the 2007 rules. Um, we're no longer looking at those economic employer concepts. We're no longer looking at days over multiple years. Uh, the new guidance just brings us more or less back in line with the tax treaty position, um, at least for those coming from countries that we have a, a tax treaty with. Um, so essentially, if you now have an employee who is resident of a country that we have a tax treaty with, um, and they have 60 workdays or less in Ireland in, in, a, in a tax year, then there's no PAYE obligation for the company. Um, if an employee has more than 60 workdays in Ireland, a dispensation from that PAYE obligation can be applied for <clears throat> and it will be granted provided the treaty conditions are met. Um, those conditions generally are that the employee has less than 183 total days in Ireland in the year, um, the employee has to be paid by a foreign employer and the costs um, are not recharged to a permanent establishment or branch of that foreign employer in Ireland. Um, so good news, I suppose that there's there's few grey areas left in this area now, um, so companies know where they stand a bit more. I guess just to mention quickly um, as well, where someone comes from a country that we don't have a tax treaty with, uh, the threshold goes to 30 workdays. Um, so if they've 30 workdays or less, there's there's no PAY obligations arising. If they've more than 30 workdays, then then PAY obligations arise from, from day one. Um, but overall, um, a positive development for companies, um, but they still do need to make sure that people coming into Ireland are tracked. And if anyone goes over the 60 workday threshold in a year, then the position is reviewed to see if the dispensation from PAYE obligations can be applied for, or else those PAYE obligations will exist. Um, so I suppose that, that's just a quick update from me. Um, I will pass back to Colin then for the, the Q&As. Great, thank you, Ian, and thanks to Jackie and Siobhan as well for your presentations earlier on. Um, glad to say we've received a large volume of questions. Uh, they're fairly evenly spread across the TWSS and EWSS areas. Um, so seeing that Siobhan had talked about the TWSS first, I'll go with questions on that first. Um, so Garod has joined us from Revenue and Garod has been deeply involved in the design of the TWSS scheme and the uh, payroll mechanics behind it. Um, so Garod, just a quick question for you around a, the compliance checks that are currently being undertaken and we've won a question in that the compliance check took place back in uh, July um, the individual has replied back to revenue with all the material and it's showing up as in progress and revenue systems and it, the question was when will those compliance checks be completed is that like a month since making the submission is that normal uh hello uh, everybody and thank you colin and delight for for hosting this this webinar um uh, I'm, I'm sort of taken aback with that question a little bit. Uh, we started the, the compliance uh, check process uh, uh, a few weeks ago and people have been very um, um, diligent in sending us back, the, in most cases, in sending us back the information we requested on a timely basis. 
I'm a bit surprised with the with that delay in returning uh, giving a response to to that case uh, without knowing the details I, I can't I can't comment on it at all but primarily like it, I was on to one of the teams uh, this morning uh, where we were discussing compliance and and the the, the news I was getting back uh, from them was that uh, people are sending in uh, information in, in most cases in a timely way and we're able to respond in a timely ma manner as well. So there could be something very specific about that case that I'm not aware of. Uh, but it's from the information I have and from looking at cases, uh, it would be, uh, it, I won't say exceptional, but it, it would be unusual for us to, okay. to have such a long day in responding. So it's best that they so contact the that, that, that question. And it's best, best that they best contact, thing the is contact the, the, yeah. the caseworker that we're asked to send that the information to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay, great. Uh, another one for you, Garod, and this has come up a, about five or six different questions in around the same theme of a question. And it's the route um, where employers have made innocent errors, like um, things are very busy back in March and April and people were trying to get to, to grips with the new scheme and the different calculations around it. And in some instances, this, I can see different examples of innocent errors have happened. And, and the employers are asking, number one, when, if this is, you go through the reconciliation process and revenue notice these, and the employer is quite happy to pay them back, um, you know, will there be any interest and penalties suffered? And is revenue system set up to automatically apply interest and penalties? Or will it be a case of, no, you go back to that caseworker that you, we already mentioned and you would discuss um, what's happened with them to explain that innocent error? Yeah, um, the reconciliation um, is, is two-phase and Siobhan that's it out there regarding getting information in what the subsidy paid and then we calculate the subsidy payable and look for the difference. And this primarily focuses on the transitional phase where uh, uh, between 26th of March and the 4th or the, the 3rd of May. Uh, in that regard, uh, we are aware of innocent errors. Uh, we're, we're aware of other errors that, that uh, employers were making because it was a difficult time and the rates were changing. But we've always said we, we would be pragmatic um, in, in any response that we have. And nowhere in the reconciliation are we looking for interest or penalties. It's simply uh, we've already paid over 410 euros per pay slip per pay date to employers and we're reconciling the difference between what should have been paid and what we actually paid. Uh, so we're not looking for um, interest or penalties in this regard. That being said, if there are cases uh, that come to light of uh, abuse, uh, then uh, we naturally uh, hold uh, back that we we may be we may have to apply interest and penalties, uh, but in the va in, it's in the vast majority of cases, it, it, there's no interest and penalties being considered for in in, the, in in the case of reconciliation. Okay, that's really helpful to hear. Um, and a related question: uh, say once that error has been noticed, and the, the employer is about to pay it back. What has to happen on the payroll side? Because they would have been under the class J9 PSI record. So does the employer have to go and reverse re-engineer things to go, okay, the, t the twist shouldn't have been given to this individual and then change it, you know, reverse that back to payroll. How's that gonna look? Yeah. That this this has been one of the conundrums that we've been facing for a long while, and we're still debating it internally as to whether it, is there a value in rewriting history. Uh, the, um, the 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 current thinking um, is that uh, where an employee uh, has received uh, a J nine, irrespective of whether they were eligible or not, that that's what they got, and we will react to it. In, 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 in that way uh, and we will you know so the reconciliation will deal with the employer what the employee got is what the employee got and we'll take care of that at the end of your process okay great um 
around the year end then with the the employees and the staycation credit question had actually come up um and what about if employees they they go and try and support the the local economies and they may feel they can claim the staycation credit that was announced in the stimulus package and they go on to revenues website which i believe is going to be receipts and um they load them up to try and get that staycation credit back will that inadvertently trigger um a twss liability on them because that subsidy is taxable in the employee's hands ultimately and i know the plan wasn't to be you know you wouldn't collect those taxes until future years 2022 onwards um so what would happen in that regard yeah, the the end of year process um, is is never simple um, because it's tax we're dealing with. Um, uh, when um, in January, on the first of January and second of January, we'll start um, doing a calculation for everybody, irrespective of whether we're on pop or TWIS or EWIS or just normal normal payroll, and we calculate uh, in revenue uh, a preliminary end of year statement for everybody which they can then see on their my account and that gives them an idea as to whether they already have uh, an underpayment or overpayment uh, in, and we invite everybody to make an income tax return uh, so that they're able to add in extra credits health expenses um, nursing home tuition fees and, and now the new uh, spend and uh, sorry stay and spend uh, tax credit the staycations tax credit. Uh, all of those are taken into account and uh, we then produce a statement of liability for the end of the year, which is a f final statement of liability. And, and that is what's coded forward into 2022, 2023, if there's still an outstanding liability. If there's uh, an overpayment and we owe money, then we'll, we'll be paying that immediately. So uh, the, the process is 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 not uh, as clear cut as you set out in in, in your in your question. So yeah. if somebody does support and hopefully they do support the economy under the new tax credit uh, and, and upload the receipts, uh, if for 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 2021 um, we'll we'll be putting that in towards the the 20 the 2020 tax liabilities the the stay and uh, spend tax credit also is available from january to march of next year um uh, so anyone who who gains that we're we're looking at uh, uh, new facilities to to make it a speedier process for next year's um stay and spend um uh expenditures but for anything that's taken place in 2020 uh, it'll go in against the statement of liability in the end of year process okay thanks for that last one on the the twss garage for you is it's about and it's kind of linking in with the ewss so you have employees who are on the twss and their employer is going to register and go on to the ewss now and the, the all the eligibility criteria is met and they know that they should be on the week one basis or they were, they were put on that week one basis um, under TWSS. Will that week one basis continue to the year end and it's under a new scheme? And number two then, is there any way of changing it back to a cumulative basis? An excellent question, one we're, we're receiving quite a lot uh, from uh, employees directly into our PAYE phone lines. Um, it's revenues view that having put them on a week one basis for a good reason to retain as much and to reduce any tax liabilities they may have for the end of the year, having received either a pandemic unemployment payment or, or a temporary wage subsidy payment, that uh, for the remainder of the year that they will stay on the week one in order to reduce any hardship they may suffer uh, if there's under liabilities at the end of the year. So this is a sort of a, a, a step to dampen um, uh, the the level of under underpayments that that people may have, um, so 
it's if people want to go back on a cumulative basis and we've had a number of, of, of cases where they've sought that uh, we will look at each case on an ex, uh, on a case by case basis but we're very reluctant to do it because of the level of uh, the hardship they may suffer later on so people may be gaining in the short term but you know there could be long term repercussions for them so we we advise them and we are very reluctantly in a few exceptional cases have we moved people from week one to cumulative. Okay, that's great. That's a clear message on that. Um, okay, Gerald, I think you're off the, the hook now. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much. Great support know, thank you. Over. Thank you for those questions. No problem. Um, and on the, the EWSS, there's a, again a few teams have come through on it. Um, one of the ones I think about 10 questions all the, the same was around um, that if you look at the uh, the results right now, maybe the end of the companies wouldn't qualify um, under EWSS. But if there was further lockdowns, and um, we can see what's happening in the likes of Kildare, where there's um, you know, localized lockdown, and that could affect some of these employers, um, should they register now, or should they only register when those difficulties hit? Hi, Colin. Uh, that's actually a question we have been asked as well. And there is a requirement to register only when you're eligible. So if you're not eligible at this stage, then you shouldn't register. You need to wait and continue doing your review if you wish uh, to determine whether you are eligible. And it's only once you become eligible that you register. You will have seen on the guidelines uh, where we were talking about registration, we have included the wording of the declaration that somebody has to sign and agree to when they actually go to register. And part of that, um, I'm just trying to get the wording up here in front of me, but it is agreeing that you, it says, I declare that I've read the eligibility criteria and that the business qualifies. So you shouldn't register until you're at the stage where the business qualifies under the eligibility conditions. Okay. Great, thanks for that. Um, another one that's coming up, is, and this is again forward planning kind of question that some employers are looking at um, just their workforce as a whole. Unfortunately, there might be some redundancies planned and they're going through that process of discussions with uh, the staff at the moment. So it mightn't be until later on this year when those redundancies are made. So are the employers, if they're otherwise eligible and the employees are eligible, are they okay to claim uh, the EWSS until those individuals um, you know, are, have left the payroll? Yes, this is one of the differences between the temporary wage subsidy scheme and the employment wage subsidy scheme. There was a requirement with the temporary wage subsidy scheme that the employer-employee relationship would be maintained. So uh, there was some doubt initially at the start even though we confirmed after that it was okay that if you intended uh, letting someone go making them redundant that you weren't maintaining the employer employee relationship that test is not part of the employment rate subsidy scheme so you will be able to claim the employment rate subsidy scheme in respect of those employees if all other conditions are met okay great and it was a related question it's not around redundancy it's actually the other way around where um there's a business that isn't doing well at the moment and they're trying to essentially trade their way out of difficulties they've there's some regulatory requirements around covid that's restricting them so they're actually having or planning in the next month or two to take on more staff and they're just wondering whether that would be uh, any any issue with, with that like they won't be losing any staff just it's going to be a net gain of staff yeah, again, there is uh, another difference between the temporary wage subsidy scheme and the employment wage subsidy scheme. With the temporary, they have to be on the payroll on a particular date. With the employment wage subsidy scheme, you just assess what wages people are paid in a particular pay period, so they don't actually have to be on your payroll at any particular time. That's ignoring the particular requirements around connected parties. Okay. There's a question then around um, bonus payments. Uh, there's a few questions on it. Um, one of them was, are we allowed to pay bonus payments under the EWSS? All things being equal and we're able to, you know, we're eligible and the employees are within the, uh, the thresholds. Is there any ban on paying bonuses? 
the employment wage subsidy scheme calculation is totally separate to any of your employment law obligations. So if you have an obligation under your uh, contract of employment to pay a particular wage, including a bonus to employees, then that has to be um, paid. The employment wage subsidy scheme will be calculated though based on the relevant pay in that pay period. So it may result in no subsidy being paid in that relevant pay period as a result of that bonus having been paid to the employee. Now there is anti-avoidance provision uh, included in the legislation. So if we see instances where there's an obligation to make your bonus payment in September, but it's deferred until the following March or April to maximize subsidy claims, then that's uh, deemed to be um, you know, a, an abuse of the scheme. So there will be ramifications if bonuses which should be paid are actually deferred otherwise than for potential genuine business reasons, maybe for cash flow difficulties, etc. Those instances would be looked at on a case by case basis. Okay. And this is another related one on bonus. So that the employer is going to go ahead and potentially make the, a bonus and a bonus payment, but it's um it's where they're paying them monthly that it, people have noticed it's a bit of a an issue that let's say you were a weekly paid person and this let's say there's five weeks in the particular month and you're going to pay the bonus on week five that may push the person over the threshold for that week but you still get the subsidy for the other four weeks of that month because the thresholds were fine then when you're paying the individual but on the monthly paid people that if you decide to pay a bonus in a particular month and once the bonus goes into the mix that it throws them over the threshold for the month it looks like there's a discrepancy between weekly and monthly is there any, um, is there any fix for um on that or what the revenue intend to do on that is it just as it is that's the way the scheme is designed now there will be other instances where it would work in employee and employer's favor so it's the way it's designed and the one thing we would just say to people if you are in a situation like that is not to abuse the scheme by potentially changing the pay, pay frequencies to ensure that a situation like that doesn't occur. So if you're on a monthly pay frequency, then you need to remain on a monthly pay frequency and not go back to weekly to avoid a situation like that occurring and then reverting back to monthly. It's just the design of the scheme. Colin, and like I say, in some instances, yeah. it, it, it works in people's favours, and in more, it just doesn't, and it's just the, the way the scheme has been designed. Okay, great. Um, I think we've covered a lot of the questions there that have come in, the different teams that have come in. Um, and just as we're at the top of the hour, I think we'll just bring the webinar to a conclusion. I'd like to thank again, Revenue and for Siobhan, um, Garode and, and Laura for joining us, the amount of support that you've given to ourselves, um, our clients and you know I've listened to you on a number of different webinars over the last few months uh, it's phenomenal work uh, and thanks again for, for taking those questions on. Um, thank you also to the attendees, um, we great responses coming through on the, the questions um, we're going to send out a recording of the, the webinar and the slides to you later on. Also, we'll have Jackie, myself and Ian's contact details in there if you want to send any of the questions to us. We'll also um, go back to some of the questions that we didn't uh, get to cover and contact you separately uh, offline uh, about that in the next few days. So just to say thanks again to everybody for attending and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.